If the Arabs hate the Prophet Ibrahim and Ibrahim was an ardent monotheist and preaching monotheism, then how did idolatry emerge in Arabia? It's a simple but an important question. Ibrahim adhered to a single god without idols. So where did the practice of idolatry originate in Arabia, particularly in Mecca? It's narrated in Sahih Muslim that an individual named Amr bin Luhai al Khuzai is seen walking in the fire of hell with his intestine horribly cut behind him, undergoing an intense and degrading punishment. But what has this got to do with idolatry in Makkah? Let's find out. The Prophet, peace be upon him, explained that Amr bin Luhai al Khuzai was the first individual to deviate from the faith of Ibrahim and Ismail. Amr ibn Luhai al Khuzai was not only the first person to change the monotheistic belief in Mecca by introducing idolatry, but also changed the original religion propagated by Ibrahim and Ismail. Why did he do that? It's narrated that Amr ibn Luhai al Khuzai traveled to Syria, which was a centuries old advanced civilization of that time. A powerful tribe by the name of Amalekite or Amalek lived there. Amr bin Luhai al Khuzai found that the people of this powerful civilization worshipped idols. So he inquired, What are these idols? They said, These idols, they are our source of power. In time of drought, hunger, or enemy attacks, we turn to these idols in prayer and miracles occur. So he requested, Could you give me one of these idols? I would like to bring it back home to Mecca. They obliged and provided him with an idol named Hubal. Amr bin Luhai al Khuzai placed Hubal in front of the Kaaba, marking the beginning of paganism in Mecca. Some accounts suggest that he modified even the Talbiya for Hajj, while others claim this change occurred in later generations. The original Talbiya by Ibrahim salam reads Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la Sharik laka Labbaik. In Alhamda, Wan Nirmata, Laka Wal Mulk, La Shari Karak. Here I am at your service, O God. Here I am. Here I am at your service. You have no partners, other gods. Here I am. To you alone is all praise and all excellence, and to you is all sovereignty. There is no partner to you. But the Quraysh changed it by saying, We have no partner except, and they put the name of Hubal instead. When did Amr bin Luhai al Khuzai brought Hubal? The reality is we don't find the exact dates because the Arabs didn't document events in a chronological manner. Similar to the ancient Chinese, they recorded events based on occasion, such as the year when the elephant attack is explained in this video. This method of recording didn't involve a calendar. The Arabs didn't adopt the Roman, Persian or the Jewish calendars. They only embraced the Islamic calendar later at the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala As they had no calendars, they associated events with specific years like the year of a notable battle, enabling them to recall and reference those periods in history. However, we can say that Amr ibn Luhai al Khuzai belonged to a generation around 500 years before the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so it took five centuries of pure paganism to spread to the whole of Arabia. Now the question emerges, how could an individual alter the religious belief established by Ibrahim? How was it possible for one person to modify the faith of their forefathers, Ibrahim, and that too of the entire community? There were three main reasons. Number one, inferiority complex. First and foremost, the inferiority complex Amr had towards the more advanced people, the Amalekites in Syria, who were a formidable civilization. Possessing elements like history, writing, architecture, and impressive buildings, they were renowned for their unbeatable nature. The Old Testament underscores the fear-inducing nature of the Amalekites, considering them an indestructible nation with their stature described as giants. There existed a perception among the Arabs that since they are a formidable nation, we should emulate and follow them in all aspects. It led to an assumption that they must be right in every aspect, including their religion. 
It's crucial that we draw lessons from this situation applicable to our times. Just because a nation is powerful doesn't guarantee possessing the right morality, ethics or theology. Similarly, technological advancements, civilization or architectural achievements don't necessarily make a nation superior in every aspect. While superiority may exist in certain domains, it doesn't encompass everything. Here we find that Amr ibn Luhai utterly was amazed at the invincibility of the Amalekites. They possessed such qualities which suggested to Amr that they must be guided. Consequently, he adopted their religion. Number 2. Influence of Important Individuals Amr ibn Luhai was not an ordinary individual. He was leader of the Khuzai tribe. At the same time, the descendants of Ismail were temporarily expelled from Mecca until Qusay, the chief of the Quraysh, reclaimed it in around 450 BC. So, esteemed as one of the most respected leaders in Arabia, Amr ibn Luhai possessed significant power, achieving numerous victories, safeguarding Mecca against external threats, and earning a reputation for generosity. Consequently, his people held him in high regard. When a leader of such stature introduced a new theology, his followers readily embraced it. Number 3. Ignorance A third factor to consider is the substantial time gap of at least 2000 years since the era of Ibrahim till the time of Amr. During this long period spanning between Ibrahim and the time of Amr ibn Luhai, the absence of guidance and prophets led to the dilution of prophetic messages and prevailing ignorance. So, three factors led to the spread of idolatry. 1. Inferiority complex. 2. Position of authority. And 3. Absence of guidance. Now, how do we relate all this to our times? Our religion is currently under siege from various quarters and we encounter these same three challenges. People are expressing peculiar ideas, urging us to embrace entirely different interpretations of our religion. We confront precisely these three challenges. Firstly, there is an inferiority complex among Muslims towards another civilization, perhaps the most dominant in technology and military strength. However, this doesn't imply that they are morally, theologically or ethically superior. Our guidance comes from the Quran and the Sunnah and we should adhere to the truth. Just because a nation surpasses us in military might, it doesn't imply they are more aligned with the truth than us. Secondly, there are individuals with numerous credentials held as reformers. They may have degrees and qualifications as high as doctorate from renowned universities. They may possess eloquence, publications, fame and intelligence, yet it doesn't mean they are upon guidance. The third factor is ignorance and the absence of guidance. The typical Muslim lacks comprehensive knowledge of their religion. When someone articulates ideas using vague slogans, it's quite easy to be captivated and fall into deception. While it may not reach the severity of shirk, we are encountering a considerable challenge of altering faith. Remember, we have the guidance in the form of Quran and Sunnah till the day of judgment. No other prophet is coming after the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it is the responsibility of every Muslim to spread the message, then share the message and earn the reward. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.